This morning uh, we're going to be looking at um, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, but I would like to, um, to read for you the entire chapter to give us the, uh, the context of this passage. So, Matthew chapter 28, uh, beginning in verse 1. Matthew writes this through the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit. Now, after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he is risen just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. Now while they were on their way, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, You are to say his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, the question that I'd like to uh, ask this morning is why would anyone want to be a missionary? I, I'm sure that's a question that we've all asked ourselves at, at least at some time in our lives. Why would anyone want to give up the comforts of home, and especially a home like this, Western culture, where we have so many things, so many blessings, so many ways to occupy our time, so many uh, recreations? Why would we want to give all those things up? Why would anyone? And put themselves into such a difficult situation of trying to convince other people that the gospel is true, that they have committed crimes against God, that they're under his judgment, but that God will forgive them if they will simply turn from their law-breaking, from their rebellion, trust in his son, and begin to live for him. Why would they do that? Well, maybe it's because they understand that that is exactly what the Lord calls us to do in the Great Commission. I think we all understand the good news isn't really going to help anyone unless we share it with others. Somebody has to do it or no one is going to be saved. Now, let me just simply say this morning that missionary work is obviously integral to the work of God's kingdom. As a matter of fact, it is shot through the scriptures, even in places where we don't 
uh, we don't see it or we don't immediately recognize it. Let me give you an example. An example of a parable that Jesus once told the Jews. In Luke 16, verses 16 through 24, the parable of the, um, the dinner. Man was giving a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slave to say to those who had been, had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all like began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a piece of land, and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I am going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have married a wife and for that reason I cannot come. And the slave came back and reported this to his master. Then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city. And bring in here the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the slave said, Master, what you have commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in, so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who are invited shall taste of my dinner. Now, what what does this parable mean? Well, obviously, the man who paid for the dinner is the father. The dinner that he prepared is the kingdom of God. Uh, Not only the forgiveness that was needed to enter into that kingdom, but the blessings that are in it through his son, the Lord Jesus. Those who were invited were the Jews. Now, when everything was ready, when the time had come, Uh, to send his son into the world. The Jews wanted nothing to do with it. They rejected Jesus. And so God, in his anger, rejected them. But we need to realize only after the Lord had given them the opportunity uh, to receive him. I mean, the Lord sent his servants out to preach to the Jews for 40 years. But because of their rejection, he set them aside and he commanded his servants to preach the gospel, the good news, to all the nations so that the kingdom, the dinner hall, would be filled with guests, so that the kingdom of God would be filled, so that he might be able to give these to his son to honor him for the work that he had done. By the way, this parable reminds us of why it is that you and I are here together today. Paul writes in Romans 11:11, 11, 11, by their transgression, that is the transgression of the Jews, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now what I'd like for us uh, to see this morning is that this parable is really all about missionary work. We need to ask ourselves the question, what does the slave represent? the one who was sent to those who were invited, the one who was sent to those who originally weren't invited. Basically, he is a missionary, and he represents what the Lord calls the church to do. Now, as you know, for the past 16 years, and I believe this is the 17th year, I guess we could say consecutive, although there was one year we only dealt with um, just, just one Sunday and didn't have a series Uh, we have had a special series during the month of October to commemorate the Reformation. Uh, The revival that God sent to his church in the 16th century when he pulled back the veil, as it were, that uh, the established church had basically, uh, over which had hidden his gospel and allowed it to shine through again in full strength. We commemorate this event because there's certain things we don't want to forget. We don't want to forget the mercy that God showed to his church in just, again, showing his gospel to the church. We don't want to forget what the gospel is, the truth that God uses to save. And we also don't want to forget the events that the Lord brought about in the history of the church, in the history of the world, to promote that truth. Now this year we're going to consider 
another facet of God's work, how it is he brings the gospel to the world. We're going to be looking at the work of missions. And basically, let me just say this by way of a preface. You know, revival is one of the ways that God advances the kingdom of heaven. So one of the ways he blesses his church, he refreshes his church, it's one of the ways he brings lots of people in. And when the people of God saw revival, when they saw the great awakening in the 18th century, you know, with, I mean, and these are people we still think about and that we still admire, George Whitfield and John and Charles Wesley, Jonathan Edwards, Tennant and others, those who saw these revivals believed that, it was, that basically God was on the verge of sending that great revival that was going to subdue all of Christ's enemies under his feet. And they began to seek the Lord and they began to pray, asking that God would send a greater revival. And they didn't actually see anything more like this in their lifetime. But the next century did see a great movement within the church that um, was the, the greatest of its kind up to that time. It's what we call the missionary movement. God began to put it upon the hearts of people to reach out with Christ cross-culturally. And basically, that's what we want to focus on during the month of October. So as I've said, we're going to set the uh, Gospel of John aside. We're going to begin to focus on missions. What we want to do is focus on the biblical basis for missions, and in the mornings and then in the evenings I want us to look at some very encouraging examples of those whom the Lord used to do this kind of work and I, and I say encouraging because I'm hoping it will be encouraging us to do the same kind of work not necessarily cross you know foreign missions cross-cultural but in our own area in our own hometown as it were so let's begin by considering uh, three things from this text. And by the way, this text gives us enough to fill up the whole month and actually could give us enough to fill up the whole year if we uh, took the approach of, of some uh, in the church to look at every detail. But certainly it won't be hard to fill up an entire month. But I want us to consider three things from this text this morning. The first one is, is basically what missionary work is. Secondly, who it is that's called to do missionary work and thirdly, <clears throat> some reasons why we should do missionary work. So first of all, what is missionary work? What do we mean when we talk about the work of a missionary? So what, what is a missionary? What do you think of when you think of a missionary? Well, again, I think like what I began with, we usually think of those who leave their hometown and country, give up all the comforts of home, and they go into a foreign country and they learn the language and they learn the culture so that they might communicate the gospel, so that they might communicate the good news of what Jesus Christ has done to save sinners so that they can be saved. Some of them even do translation work. They learn the language well enough and they study the scriptures well enough, the original languages, to produce a translation. That's what the Miles have been doing for many, many years. I think they retired now and somebody else has taken up the work. But they're trying to bring to that culture the kingdom of God. And they have to start, of course, with the king and what he has done to, sing, uh, to save individuals. So I think that's what we typically think of with the work of missions. But I think we also tend to think that this work is done only by a select group of elite Christians who are especially gifted and called by the Lord to do it. And we need to realize there are some aspects in which that is true. But what I'd like for us to consider this morning is that the biblical defin definition of missionary is actually much broader than that. First of all, it doesn't apply just to those who share the gospel cross-culturally in foreign countries. Now, how do we know that? Well, again, consider our text. How many nations does Jesus tell his disciples that they are to evangelize? He basically says in Matthew 28, 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Now all the nations certainly includes the one in which they were living. I don't think we have to look for somebody from another country to send missionaries here. Missionaries can be those in this country who are reaching out to those who are around them. Consider what Jesus says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. 
which you've already read in our reading of God's law. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Now notice they weren't to exclude where they were living. That's where they were to begin. Begin in Jerusalem where they were and then expand the circle until they reach the furthest parts of the earth. Now these are missionaries. Now why is it that we use the word missionary? I mean typically we use missionary to refer to foreign missionaries and I understand that but what does the word actually mean? It, it actually comes from the Latin word missio which basically means to send. And the word missionary itself means one who is sent to propagate or to spread religion. And of course we know that there are missionaries of various religions and so forth but for our purposes we'll talk about those who are sent to spread the true religion, to spread the gospel to others. They're called missionaries because they are sent and they are sent of course by Jesus. Jesus says again in Matthew 28, 19, go. That's Jesus sending. Make disciples of all the nations. Now one thing we're going to come back to later in this month is the fact that Jesus didn't send them merely to share good news with others. It wasn't just to put a notch on their Bibles as it were or on their belt. That was only the first step. He sent them to make disciples, to baptize, and to teach them. We see that in verses 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. The ultimate goal of missionary work is basically not to save souls. Okay, that's how we often think about it. Got to save this person so he doesn't go to hell but instead goes to heaven. That is important. And that is one of the reasons, but it's not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to create, by God's grace, more laborers to be able to take part in the work of the kingdom of heaven, which in other places in Scripture is likened to you know, a, a vineyard where Jesus sends laborers to go labor in the vineyard. They're not idle in the vineyard, but they're sent in the vineyard to work, to do the work of the kingdom. This is how the kingdom of God advances. People are saved, they're discipled, and then they go out and they seek to witness and to bring others to Christ so that they can be baptized and discipled so that they can win others. This is how the kingdom advances. This is how the kingdom grows. This is how eventually it's going to fill the whole earth. So basically, that's what missionary work is. It is bringing the gospel to others and as they're brought to Christ, discipling them so that they can do the work as well. Now, so far we've been looking at missionary work just sort of abstractly, kind of holding it at arm's length so that we can examine it a bit. But I'd like for us to zero in now and ask the question whether it's true that this work is only for a specific elite group of Christians specially called and gifted by the Lord. Now certainly we would say that that's true with regard to foreign missions, although we'll find with David Brainerd, not necessarily so. But certain kinds of work require certain kinds of gift. And the Lord has gifted certain people and he's put a place a certain call on certain people to do this work foreign, in foreign countries, cross-culturally. But what I'd like for us to understand from our text this morning is that God calls all of his people to be missionaries of one kind or another. Now consider to whom he gave the great commission. Verses 18 and 19. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore. Now Jesus obviously gave this to them, which are the 11 remaining disciples. But why did the Lord give it to them? Well, it was so that they might carry on the work of Christ to make disciples and to lead the church in this process of advancing the kingdom of heaven through evangelism. Again, consider what Jesus says in Acts chapter 1, 
verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in, Judea, in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Now we do recognize that Jesus again was speaking to the eleven. But we also need to recognize the eleven were not the only ones to receive the power of the Holy Spirit on that day when Jesus sent the Spirit to give them the ability to share Christ with others. We read in Acts chapter 2 verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now, how many people were there on the day of Pentecost? How many were in that place they had gathered together? How many were filled with the Spirit? Well, earlier we saw that 120 persons had gathered to pray in the upper room, waiting for the promise of the Father which Jesus had reminded his disciples, waiting for the Spirit of God. Now, when that, by the way, there was only 10 days between that prayer meeting, or maybe less, and when the Spirit of God came, they didn't just continue for weeks and months before the Spirit came. How many people were there when the Spirit finally came? Well, I would say at least... The 120, there could have been more, there could have been less. But we do know that everyone who was there received the Spirit. The Apostle Paul tells us that every believer is baptized by the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. And we are all made to drink of one Spirit. Paul tells us that every believer is commanded to be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5.18, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And Paul tells us <clears throat> the Spirit brings with that baptism the power to do God's will. Not only the power, but also the desire. 2 Timothy 1.7 for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. You know, it's interesting that when uh, Paul, when he was still unconverted, he was still Saul, instituted that persecution against the church in Jerusalem, scattering all the believers throughout Judea and Samaria. We read in Acts 8, verse 4, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word, that is, they all went about evangelizing. Now, who were these people that got scattered? Were these the apostles? As a matter of fact, Luke goes on to tell us that the apostles alone remained in Jerusalem. It was all the other believers that got scattered. And everywhere they went, they went evangelizing, sharing the gospel, the good news with others. Every believer in the early church received the power to be witnesses, and that's exactly what they did because that is the kind of heart the Spirit of God gives. That is the power that He gives, that desire. One that makes us want to share the good news of what Jesus Christ has done with others. That is what the Spirit of God has actually given to you if you belong to Him this morning. It's the same kind of heart that He gives to all of His children. Uh, to do his will, whether it's something that is easy to do or difficult. On one occasion, the Lord uh, in his counsel was basically asking, you know, whom are we going to send to take my message to my people in Judah to warn them of the coming exile? He says in Isaiah 6, 8, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Isaiah replied, here am I. Send me. Now the reason why Isaiah said that was because he had God's Spirit living within him. It made him willing to share that gospel with others even though it's not always a welcome message. 
Now, God was sending Isaiah to Judah with a message that wasn't going to be pleasing to Judah. You've sinned. You've broken the covenant. God is going to send you into exile. Well, God has also given us some news to share, which isn't exactly pleasant, which is, hey, you've sinned. You've broken God's commandments. You've broken His law. You're under His judgment. You need to repent. But He's also given us good news, hasn't He? That if you will repent and turn to Jesus Christ, you will have full forgiveness of sins. If you will follow Him, Jesus will keep you. He will bring you safely to heaven. As a matter of fact, He will even give you the heart to do that. If you will simply trust him. Now again, we kind of shudder at the, at the news of, uh, or at the prospect of telling somebody that they're a sinner and on their way to heaven. Uh, but if you don't warn someone of their danger, they're going to remain in their danger. They're not going to be awakened, which is again what the Great Awakening was all about. The Spirit of God took that message and he shook people with it. And he woke them out of their slumber, out of their sleep, and he made them afraid so they would begin to seek after the Lord. That is a part of the gospel message. But it is one that we will be willing to share if we have the Spirit of God inside of us, but particularly that good news of the gospel. The good news really doesn't appear to be good news until you actually share the bad news. If you think by telling people that if they trust Jesus, they're going to be saved, that that's enough, it's, it's not enough. Why should I? I'm a pretty good guy. I'm not in any difficulties. Everything's going well for me. I mean, just try that among the middle class and among those, the upper middle class. They won't give you the time of day. But those who know of their difficulties and of their struggles and of, the, of, of their danger, they will listen to you. Those are the ones typically that are more down and out than that which is going well for others. Our Lord Jesus Christ said to his disciples before he sent them out to preach the gospel in the towns and villages of Israel, freely you received, freely give. As those who have freely received God's grace through the gospel, we are freely to give what the Lord has given to us, to others, freely to share it. And again, if we have God's spirit within us, we certainly will want to do that. Now, finally this morning, I want to ask the question, why should we do missionary work? And I, I think the uh, reasons are, are obvious, but I do want to make sure that we understand. Why should we do it? We should do it, first of all, because this is what Jesus, who is our captain, who is our Lord, who is our commander-in-chief, this is what he commands us to do. And yes, the word command still does mean something to the Christian. It means something to each one of us. It is a duty that is placed upon us that we are to fulfill. Now the point that Stuart Elliott was making is not that there are no rules and not that there are no commands that we have to submit to, but what he's saying is you can't save yourself by keeping those commandments. You can't sanctify yourself by keeping those commandments. God has given you His Spirit so that you will want to keep His commandments, so that you will want to obey, but it's still a commandment, and we still need to obey. It's just that our motive has changed. We do it now out of love for the Savior, but it is a command. Jesus tells us in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, uh, Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You know, it's been pointed out that there's really only one command that is mentioned here and the rest are basically parts of the process. Make disciples is the command. Now, to do that, you have to go. To do that, you have to, uh, of course, evangelize. You have to baptize. You have to teach. All of this is a part of making disciples, but the commandment is make disciples. That's what the Lord wants His church to do. Now, obviously, just because the Lord gives us His Holy Spirit and He gives us a measure of a desire to do this work, that doesn't mean that we're always going to want to do it. 
I mean, that's another thing that came out from that sermon by Stuart Elliott and in Romans chapter 7 in particular. There is a struggle that is going on in our hearts between the flesh and the spirit over this very issue. And I would say this, this probably more than just about anything else. Sharing the gospel. What is the thing that is the most difficult to do in all the world? For most of us, it is sharing the gospel with others. And it's because of this struggle. But I want you to realize that we're in good company. The Apostle Paul shared this struggle too. We might look at his life and say, how can you say that? I mean, he was somebody who almost single-handedly evangelized the whole Roman Empire. But do you know that he even struggled with obedience at times? He was only a man, like we are. He was not God in human flesh. He was not like Christ. He didn't have a special dispensation from the Lord. Even he struggled with it and realized, though, when he did, that he still needed to do it, whether he felt like it or not, because it was his duty. Listen to what he writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 16 and 17. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel." By the way, I should mention, this has specifically to do with Paul's calling to, to be the gospel to the Gentiles. Um, there, there are certain senses where this applies to us, but particularly to him, because this was what the Lord saved him and called him to do. But listen now, he goes on in verse 17. For if I do this voluntarily, I have a reward, but if against my will, I have a stewardship entrusted to me. Now, was Paul telling us that he didn't want to do this work? Well, he was telling us sometimes he didn't. But sometimes when he, fe he didn't feel like doing it, he, ha he realized that he still had a stewardship that was entrusted to him, and he had to preach the gospel. So either with his whole heart, with only part of his heart, he still did it because he knew this is what the Lord called him to do. Now again, what is the point? Well, the point is Jesus has also called us to evangelize. And maybe sometimes we don't want to do it. Sometimes we look at it as too difficult. Sometimes we excuse ourselves and we say, well, if this person's elect, he's going to be saved. If this person's elect, someone else is going to bring the gospel. Somebody else is going to bring it who can do it much better than me. So I'm not going to ruin this person's chances by blowing it and telling them what I, can, you know, what I can tell them. I'm going to wait for somebody more skilled to do this. Well, there's all these excuses. Those all come from the flesh, don't they? Not from the Spirit. The Spirit is basically moving us to say, how can I bring Christ to them? I'm going to do the very best I can. He's given me this opportunity. This is why the Lord saved us. This is why the Lord discipled us. This is why we remain in this world after he saves us and we don't go to heaven just yet is so that we can share this good news with other people. So when we ask the question, why should we do missionary work? Well, first of all, we have to answer because it is our duty. But we realize at the same time there are other answers to that question which can actually lighten the load and make it more of a pleasure to share the gospel with others just like the Apostle Paul experienced when he says, if I do this voluntarily, God has given us his spirit so that we will do it voluntarily, but he has also given to us many reasons why we should do this voluntarily, such as love, love for God, love for the Father, Love for the Son. I mean, what does the Lord's table remind all of us here this morning of except that God loved you so much that he was willing to send his Son into the world so that if you would just believe, he would save you. Jesus came into the world and he suffered and died for you while you were still his enemies. So what should you be willing to do for him? How much do you owe him? for this love. Well, here's a debt of love that you can never repay. This is one reason why when the Lord says you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, why it is you should yield to that command and love him in that way is because he has loved you in this way. 
This is why you should be living for his glory. This is why you should be asking yourself in everything that you do, as we were encouraged to do last week, what is in it for him? Not just what's in it for me, but what's in it for him? How can I live for him? How can I do what I'm doing for his glory? So here's another reason, love, love for God. Well, here's, here's another reason. Our evangelism is the only way that Jesus can actually receive his reward. Remember that the Father has promised Jesus Christ a reward for his work, and that is those for whom he laid down his life. Well, those sheep that belong to Jesus Christ can only be gathered through the preaching of the gospel, through evangelism. They are only gathered in when the good news is shared with other people. This is the only way that the kingdom of Christ actually advances. It is the culmination of all of our prayers and all of our efforts is that the message is actually communicated and people are actually saved. Now, do you want your Savior who died for you to receive his reward? Do you want his kingdom to grow? Do you want him to be honored in, in the extension of his kingdom throughout the world? The only way it's going to happen is if you and I evangelize other people, share the good news with them. Have you considered what a privilege it is to be able to do this? God has actually given this honor to us. He hasn't given it to the angels. Uh, he could have, and the angels perhaps <laughs> would, would be more efficient in it, and certainly if somebody saw an angel, that would go a long ways to convincing them the truth of the gospel, I suppose, but maybe not. I guess not, because God still has to change their hearts. They'd be convinced maybe up here, but not here. But God has not chosen the angels to share this message, to make them his ambassadors. Rather, he has chosen us. He has given us this honor. We are his ambassadors. We have the good news entrusted to us, a treasure that we are to share with other people. And what about other people? What other motives can we think of to reach out to them? Well, what about love for them? What about those you care about? You know, the only way that your unsafe family members, the only way your unsafe friends, the only way your unsafe neighbors, people you work with, the only way they are going to escape the flames of hell, which are very real, and enter finally into heaven is through the gospel. You see, they have to be evangelized. How many people do they know that know the gospel? I don't know. Maybe you don't know. But we know them, and we know the gospel, and we can share it with them. And if we love them, that's another reason why we should reach out to them because that is the only way they're going to be saved. Now, again, we all understand that this work is uncomfortable work. It's difficult work. It's especially difficult if you're never in the right frame of mind, the right frame of heart, if you're never prepared to reach out to them, if you're not filled with God's Holy Spirit, that's why the Apostle Paul, who was only a man, sometimes found himself in a situation where he had enough abuse, enough hatred, enough persecution, and maybe he was saying to himself, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> but he, he again, he remembered if it was against his will, he still had this stewardship that was entrusted to him, so he continued to move forward. This work is difficult and it's going to be uncomfortable. It can have consequences. It can mean that you're going to face people that hate you, undoubtedly. It can mean that you're going to lose friends. You may lose all your friends if your friends are not believers. It can mean that you'll be persecuted. I mean, look at the people standing up today for what they believe to be right who are even losing their businesses because they want to honor Christ. But we do need to remember one thing, actually several things. It is our duty. This is how the kingdom of heaven advances. This is the only way they're going to be saved. But let's not forget the blessing that God gives to us individually. And perhaps one of the motives, undoubtedly one of the motives that kept the Apostle Paul going at all times. And that is 
just that experience that God gives to you when you share the gospel with others. And even when you're hated for it, even when you're persecuted for it, just there is that experiential end, knowing either that you're standing in the, in the place of Christ, taking the abuse meant for Him, or simply the Spirit of God is working through you to share the gospel with others. We talked about this on the Wednesday, at the Wednesday study. There is an experience of blessing which sometimes the Lord gives, which is perhaps the greatest joy that you will ever experience on earth if you simply yield to the Spirit of God. Do what the Spirit of God is calling you to do and issue that invitation to others to receive the Lord Jesus Christ and to receive His life. There's really nothing else like it on earth and I'm hoping that, again, through what it is that we're, we're looking at here, through all these different motives that pull us, as it were, conspire um, to work on us to get us to do this, as well as the examples that we're going to see in the evening, that we'll be encouraged to reach out and do this. I mean, what's the worst thing that anybody can do to you today in our culture? For the most part, maybe get angry at you, call you a nasty name maybe. Stop being your friend, okay? You know, there's, you know, we don't necessarily enjoy that, but that's not so bad. What did Jesus go through for us? What was he willing to go through to bring the gospel to us, to make a gospel for us? Far worse than that. He was handed over to men who had the authority to beat him, to mock him, to abuse him, and finally to crucify him. And he went through much worse than that. He experienced God's full wrath on the cross. Considering his love for us, are we willing to run the risk that all his people actually, uh, well, not well, all who are willing to do this went through in order to bring Christ to others? If we do, I think we'll discover what they discovered. It's far more blessed to give than to receive. It's more blessed to give the gospel and suffer that hatred than it is to hang on to it ourselves and to let these people die without ever hearing the gospel. So again, I'm hoping that the Lord will use this to encourage all of us to just use those connections we already have and to reach out to others, to invite other people to hear the gospel, to invite them to come to the Reformation series, to work a revival within us, to encourage us, to put greater effort into doing what it is that our Lord has actually saved us and called us to do, which is to reach out to others. Well, let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's, let's ask the Lord to apply his word to our hearts this morning.